in a series, uh, we, we may have, uh, we may take a look at this one more week, and uh, the title is God is Awesome, God is Awesome, Every day. and today uh, our title is Looky Lou, uh, Looky Lou, now as I, as we start, I'm going to bring out four points, and they're a little bit scattered, and, and I'm fully aware of that, but I want you to track with me the best that you can. Uh, because I'm hoping that it'll all make sense as we go through it. You see, there are a lot of people that they do not realize the awesomeness of God. There are a lot of believers today, they don't realize the goodness of God. It, it's a concept that they don't have. They, they think of God in all kinds of terms other than being good. The things that they've done in life that has brought their own demise, they blame on God. Uh, they see somebody hurt or somebody sick or somebody that passes away, they blame God. Or an earthquake, they, they blame God. That is not God's doing. That is not God's doing. And we're not going to go back. If you miss that, go to our website, go back about three or four weeks, and you'll see we talk about it. It is not God's doing. But in all of that, God is trying to express his goodness even when we are our own worst enemy. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Even when you are doing stupid, God is trying to show his goodness in it. He's trying to show you that he is good to you even when we are doing crazy stuff. So I want to look. The first thing I want to look at is we look at him. You see, God so wanted to show us his goodness. And you track through the Old Testament, and you'll find that over and over again, God was trying to display his goodness to mankind. And it wasn't working well from Genesis all the way up through the end of the Old Testament. It, it didn't work well. People didn't get it. And we could spend weeks going through the sacrifices and, and everything that was given to the children of Israel and showing God's goodness in it. How he was trying to show them another way other than the way of the pagans. But they still weren't getting it. And we come all the way up to the time of the New Testament, and this is what I believe. I believe, you know, we, we know that Jesus Christ came to die for our sins, correct? Right. Which is the ultimate expression of God's goodness. Is it not? That Jesus Amen. said, there is no greater gift. Uh -huh. It doesn't get better than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friend. Uh -huh. There's nothing bigger that you can do. If, if, if you were convicted and you were sentenced to die, and I went to court and I said, now what can I give you? What's the biggest gift that I can give you? A new car is not going to mean much to you. Uh, a house is not going to mean a lot to you. But if I raise my hand in court and I say to the judge, judge, uh, I'm willing to take his spot on death row, and the judge knows you are, okay, so order, and I get cuffed, and I get the orange suit, and they take me away, and they let you go. Mm -hmm. That is the greatest gift I could ever give you would be your freedom. I took your place. So we know that's why Jesus came. That was the ultimate gift, the ultimate expression of God's goodness to us. I love you so much, I'm going to give my life for you. Amen. But I believe it goes deeper. I believe that when Jesus came, Jesus' life mirrored God's goodness. Jesus said, if you see me, uh, you see the Father. And I believe that what Jesus was doing was he was showing people God's goodness in everything he did. He mirrored the goodness of God. So when Jesus came across disease, what does the goodness of God do? It heals the disease. It takes care of the disease. When Jesus came across demons and people were tormented, the goodness of God frees those people from demonic torment. When Jesus came across people uh, that had nothing to eat, what does the goodness of God do? The goodness of God gives them something to eat. 
when Jesus came across a woman whose daughter had died, what does the goodness of God do? The goodness of God consoles the woman, and then he raises the daughter back to life. Everything that Jesus did was to display God's goodness, to put it on display. If you want to see what God is like, look at me. Look at what I do. Look at how I react. Look at the leper. The goodness of God goes out and hugs a leper. That's how much God loves you. He hugs you in your decay. He hugs you. He touches you. He reaches you. He's not afraid of you. He doesn't keep his distance because that's what the goodness of God does. That's what it's all about. In order to show the goodness of God, Jesus broke religious rules. Religious rules that you can only be good at these times, and you can't be good on those days. You, you can be good on a Friday, but you can't be good on a Sunday. How many of you know that God is good all the time? Yeah. So Jesus, when it came to religious rules, Jesus ignored the religious rule to show God's goodness. Despite the rule, goodness trumps. You know, I, I'm convinced that people are, that are rule-minded have never been in touch with God's goodness. Because God's goodness and God's grace breaks rules. God is not bound by religious rules. <laughs> I was sharing, we, we, we had a meeting, and uh, the subject came up of millennials and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and anyway, I had a flashback to when I gave my heart to the Lord. And I had a flashback uh, to what I looked like. I came from the whole hippie generation and, and everything. And I had a flashback of what it was like to walk into church because a bunch of us were getting saved at the beach. And, and uh, there was only one church that would accept us. None, none of the churches wanted us because they were afraid of us. I mean, uh, if you came in with no shoes on and a ripped shirt and ripped pants and patches, long hair and a beard, uh, you either sat in the back or they kindly asked you to leave. But we were genuinely saved. We loved Jesus with all our heart. We just couldn't fit in anywhere. And, and I remember there was this church in Redondo Beach uh, pastored by a guy named Stenus. Uh, Stenus. And, and I remember Stenus was old Pentecostal. He, he, he was completely weird to me. He had a black suit, a white shirt, black tie. And he wore that all the time. We'd go to Stenus Church and we'd sit in the back and uh, he played the drums during worship and they had the old Pentecostal worship. Oh, no, 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 you know, and he'd beat on the drums and then he'd get up and preach and he'd pull out a white hanky and he'd start waving the hanky and he'd run up and down and he'd jump over the altar and jump back. And we, we were like, what in the world is this dude doing? This dude is just absolutely crazy. But, but, but you know, we love Brother Stenus, and we love the church, not because he was like us, because he loved us. Amen. And there were people in his church that said, if you let those hippies come to this church, uh, we're going to leave. You know what he told them? Bye. Wow. Goodbye. Because we're going to love everybody. God hit that church with such a revival, it was incredible. Amen. I didn't personally do this, but... The gentleman that, that, that was a part of our group, Lonnie Frisbee, used to go down to Hermosa Beach, Manhattan Beach, and he picked stoners off the sand that are passed out on the sand, blacked out coal, uh, and he'd put them in the back of his pickup truck, and a group of guys would bring them all into church, line them up in the front row, knock out coal, stone out of his mind, and we'd all sit there and say, wait till Brother Steena starts preaching. And that man would start screaming and waving his white hanky, and the power of God would hit them, and they'd wake up and be alert, not knowing, how did I get here? And who's the man in the black suit, black tie, yelling at me with a white? And they'd get saved. And we'd do it again, and again, and again, and again. Pretty soon the whole church is filled with wild, crazy hippies that love God. Amen. He broke the rules. 
because he saw grace and he saw goodness and he wanted to display the goodness of God. And God used that because his heart was like God's. Amen. A while back I'm driving and have you ever have you ever broken the law and you just knew it? <laughs> you, you knew I was running a red light making a U-turn and I was thinking uh, I was I, the light turned red and I went for it anyway and I'm making the U-turn and I'm thinking this ain't good, this ain't good, this ain't good because I'm in Brentwood and the police in Brentwood are militant. I mean, yeah. they, they don't pull you over with one car, they pull you over with three cars you know, uh, for a traffic car. They, they got policemen all around you, they're all ready to draw and get up and I'm thinking, oh, this ain't good. And Deborah's yelling at me, this ain't good, this ain't good. <laughs> And I'm thinking, maybe I can make it through Brentwood before anybody, and sure enough, there is a red light behind me. And I pulled over, and I just said, this is not good, this is not good. I know Brentwood police, they're, they're, they'll have me out with my hands on the road. <laughs> so she walked up, she said, uh, she said, can I see your driver's license and you know, insurance? And I said, yeah. So I handed it to her, and she said, I'll be right back, don't move. And Brentwood means that, you know, Move. She went back with a spotlight on the back of our car, and I, went, I said, I'm not moving for the life of I'm not moving, I'm not blinking. And she came back, she, she said, you know what you did, right? And I said, yeah. She gave me my license and my registration back. She said, you can go. Nice. And I said, what? <laughs> she, said, she said, you can go. Don't do it again. Okay. I said, yes, ma'am. And we drove off. Here's why I share that. I broke a rule. She decided to have goodness on me. Ask me what I remember of that event. I remember the goodness. I remember the goodness. I remember her. Because I remember her goodness to me. You see, God puts his goodness on display what? To show you his love for you yeah. and his good intentions for you and what he wants to do in your life. And, and, and if you'll look around and begin to look around, you'll see it. You'll see goodness coming at you. You'll see goodness coming at you yeah. all the time. God's goodness and God's oh, grace and God's love. Right. <clears throat> Sometimes big ways, sometimes small ways. If you're looking for it. Deborah and I, we were down south, and uh, my meeting ended, when did it end? Friday at noon. And we had an afternoon to kill, and we said, let's go down to Laguna Beach and have lunch. And I said, sure, let's go to Laguna and have lunch. And, 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 and she looked it up on the app, and she said, Laguna has a parking problem, it's really bad, which freaked me out. Because if you know me, and you've ever hung with me, I am anal about my car. <laughs> Nobody parks by my car, ever. <laughs> I take two places all the time, and I do it at the rear of the lot, so nobody has a right to get mad at me, because I didn't take your place, I'll walk. And she said that, and I almost went, <laughs> We ain't going to Laguna. I ain't going to be parking feet in a meter. And I started making excuses. I only got three quarters. We can't make a meter. Maybe we ought to turn back. Maybe we shouldn't go. She said, honey, there's a chase. You got a debit card. You can go get some change. <laughs> so we get to Laguna, and it is bumper to bumper parking. I'm like, I cannot believe this. There is no place to park. And I can't feed a meter. So I don't even know where there's a chase, and I'm not going to sit in this traffic looking for a chase. And you know how the anxiety starts to build a little bit? Yeah. I go a block, go another block. For some reason, on the left, we went down a street, and there was one parking place with no meter, with a red zone in front and a red zone in back. <laughs> 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 Hallelujah. I said, I said, I said, and so I'm thinking, God, did you really do this? Because I'm anal about my car? You really? You understand? 
it. I don't want to do it. You get me? Deborah doesn't even get me, but you got it. And you gave me my own part. But isn't there a difference between two red songs? We walk down to this restaurant. And I'm thinking, man, we're not gonna find a place to eat. This is, you know, this is high rent district, you know. We walked out there and said, let's go check this place. So we checked the place. It's, it, the, 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 the menu is reasonable. I said, they'll never see us. They'll never see us. So she walks up and goes, uh, do you have a table for two? They said, yeah. Right there. We're sitting on a table. There is a cliff, and there's the beach down below us, and all the ocean as far as the eye could see. It was the most beautiful, romantic thing that could ever happen. I'm eating lunch, and I feel God say, don't ever doubt my goodness towards you. Now, some people would have missed that, but because I'm sharing on it, I'm tuned in to his goodness in every way, shape, and form that it comes. Let me give you, let me give you a, a second thing. God's goodness is always in forward motion. Okay, what do you, you, you know, what, what do you mean by that? This is the way I think about it. God's goodness is always moving forward. God's goodness, it, it, it never gets turned off. It never stops. God doesn't have a bad day and decide not to be good to you today. He, he doesn't take a break. He doesn't, he doesn't go on a trip and he doesn't accidentally Forget it. Amen. He is good moving forward all the time. Amen. And if you really want to know, the Bible says that his goodness continues to increase. It never decreases. It is always on the increase. I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. You see, when he displays it, he displays it over and over, bigger and bigger, and greater and greater. And he doesn't stop. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says, And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. Oh, did I say that? Ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So let, let's break that down. Let's break this verse down. And let, let's just put it in compartments for just a minute. Because it's a little bit wordy. But let's break it down. So notice this. He says, we have uh, unveiled faces. What, what does Paul mean by that? We, we're, we're seeing God with, with, with an unveiled face. What does he mean? He's saying that in Old Testament tradition, you never got close to God's goodness and God's glory without having a veil. But Paul is saying that we are seeing God with an unveiled face. God has removed all obstacles when it comes to seeing his goodness. There, there is not an obstacle between you and him when it comes to seeing his goodness to you. And then the second, it says, so there's nothing standing in the way. And it says that we, we begin to contemplate his glory and goodness. What, what does that mean? It means that as you think about it, and as you acknowledge it, and as you see it, and as you taste it, and as you experience it, you, you begin to contemplate how much God actually loves you. Now for some, that's monumental because you've never been really loved in your whole life. For some, you maybe had a dysfunctional home or a parent that left you or a dad that didn't like you or, a, you know, you know. And you grew up with a feeling of being unloved. But God is trying to show you he's not like your parents. And as you contemplate it, and as you begin to see it and acknowledge it, it does something in you. 
Then he goes on and he says that in the process, we, dis we start to become like him. Yes. Goodness attracts goodness. Amen. And we start being like him. You know, you can't be holy on your own. You, you cannot live an unsinful life on your own. I, I've stopped trying to, I, I've said this before, I never tell people don't sin. Because outside of his goodness in your life, it is, it is wasting my time to say don't sin. Because you're going to do it anyway. But when you begin to experience his goodness, and it begins to flow in your life and every day good things and you're excited and you're loving him and you're praising him. Something happens in you. You become like him. Does that make sense? Yes. It's not that you grit your teeth and say, oh, I'm going to be holy. I got to do this and that. Because you can't. But as you begin to experience his love and his hope, and his goodness to you, you the Bible, Paul says, man, you become, you start to become like him. And then he says, with ever increasing glory, it doesn't stop. Ever increasing glory, the more we experience it, the more we will reflect it. Paul said this. Paul said, I'm convinced. That God who has begun a good work in me, he will bring it to completion. I'm convinced of that. Because why? His goodness never stops. He begun it. He's doing it. He will complete it. There is a completion. And the completion will be when I stand before him. So, so if I really believe this, then I would, I, I would be... Forced to say, this year is better than last year. Last year was better than the year before. My next year is even going to be better than this year because his goodness is moving me forward from glory to glory. And he's bringing to completion what he's begun in me. See, there are some people here today, God has begun something in you, but you thought he abandoned it. You, you thought he stopped it somewhere along the way. You thought he got tired of it. But, but I'm here to tell you that he is saying that he has never stopped. You know, you can stop it. You, you can stop his goodness, but he'll never stop his goodness. You, you can refuse his goodness, but he'll never stop giving it because that's his nature. Number three, uh, what is it? What's in your purse? What is in your purse? You know, you can have a million dollars in the bank and have a debit card in your purse and you can starve to death. If you do not use your debit card and make a withdrawal from the bank, you can starve to death. And if you do not make a withdrawal from the bank, it is not the bank's fault that's holding your money. It's the fact that you didn't make a withdrawal. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 21 through 23. Let's read what Paul said about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 21. So then, Paul's addressing an issue in the church of competition. So then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours. Whether Paul, Apollos, uh, or Cephas, or the world, or life, or death, or the present, or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ, and Christ is of God. That is amazing to me. And I am still trying to get my mind around the fact that in Jesus Christ all things are yours. Does that make sense? What, what do you have need of today? He has already given it to you. 
Uh, well, Pastor, I'm not in my right mind. All things are yours. He has given you a right mind. Well, Pastor, I, 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 I don't know how I'm going to pay the bills this month. Well, all things are yours. He has already made a provision. He didn't say it's going to be yours. He said it is yours in Jesus Christ. It is yours. How many of us live life like that? It is mine. It's already mine. I'm using my debit card and I'm going to draw it out. It is mine. Peace is mine. Joy is mine. Mental health is mine. It's all mine. Freedom from narcotics. It is mine. He's already given it to me and I'm making a withdrawal. It's mine. I'm not going to let it just sit in the bank while I starve to death. It's mine. Let's go to John chapter 16, and verse 14. Jesus is speaking of the Holy Spirit. And he says this of the Holy Spirit. He, he says, and he will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is Jesus speaking. All that belongs to the Father, all that God has is mine. Jesus said that. That is why I said, the Spirit will receive from me and he will make it known to you. All right, let me break it down this way. God so wants you to know what is yours. He doesn't want you to be in the dark about it. He doesn't want you to guess. He doesn't want you to, to you know, is it, is it not? He, he so wants you to know what is yours. Listen carefully, because I am Pentecostal, but I'm a weird Pentecostal. I don't believe that the purpose, the main purpose of the Holy Spirit is to speak in tongues. I believe in speaking in tongues, I do. But I don't believe that's the main purpose. I don't believe that the main purpose are the gifts of the Spirit in operation. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. Yeah. I want more of the gifts of the Spirit operating within City Church. Yeah. I want more healing. I want more prophetic word. I, I want more wisdom. I want more gifts uh, of generosity. I want all of that because it is real. And it is what he does. But, but it is not the main thing he does. God so wants you to know his goodness that he put his spirit in you to do the main thing. And the main thing is this, to tell you everything that is Christ that now belongs to you. That's the main thing. So when we say, when we say, come down and be filled with the Holy Spirit and we pray for you and, and, and some people focus on, well, let's pray that God's going to give you a prayer language and, and, and I'm glad he does and, and he, he, everybody has one. You don't have to use it, but everybody has one who's had the Holy Spirit. It's, it's a product of the Holy Spirit. Some people don't want to use it. Some people don't believe in it. That's okay. Paul said, I speak in tongues more than you all. I edify myself. We, and we'll talk about that in a later date. But, but it doesn't mean that you don't have the Holy Spirit. The sign that you have the Holy Spirit, the sign isn't are you speaking in tongues. The sign is, is he telling you what is Jesus that is now yours? Is he telling you that? If he's telling you that, that is his job, yeah. is to share with you all the time, share with you. You're in a situation. You're in a circumstance. Something's happening in your life. And, I, and you tap into God. God, I, I, I just need your help. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit comes speaking in you and says, It is Jesus' victory. He has victory. And he has now shared his victory with you. It is now yours. Walk out in it. And you begin to walk in a new victory. Because if you don't know what is yours, you will never exercise in using it. 
It's like having a million dollars in the bank and a debit card in your purse. But if you don't know the million dollars in the bank, you'll never pull the debit card out, will you? And you'll starve. If you are not feeling that from the Holy Spirit, I would encourage you that you find some quiet time uh, today, tomorrow, sometime, and you sit with God and you say, God, I, you put your Holy Spirit in me. I'm listening. Begin to speak to me. What is Jesus? Jesus said, I, I have everything from the Father. Everything. And my spirit is in you to tell you what I have that is now yours. My spirit is in you to do that. And I believe that if you will begin to ask him, he will begin to do that in you. And he will do it more and more and more and more. The more you listen, the more he'll speak. And life will start to change dramatically. I'm going to leave you with this, with this, last, with this last point. Show it. Show it. God's goodness is attractive, and people need to see it. And when they see it, they're attracted to it. They're not attracted by what you say. They are attracted by what they see. I left the meeting and there were a couple of gentlemen, I commented to Deborah. There were a couple, two gentlemen in particular that, and I associate with these guys, I've known them for many years, but these two gentlemen, I, I, I had the chance to interact with them one-on-one, -on -one, eye to eye, for, uh, you know, more than a, how are you doing, God bless you, see you next year. And I left, one gentleman, his name is Ed Stanton. He pastors in Washington. And the other gentleman's a quiet guy. Quiet. Um, Robert Garcia pastors in the LA area. Quiet, unassuming guy. And my interaction with them, they didn't say anything to me profound. But there was something radiating from them. And I felt it. You know what I felt? I felt pure goodness. Amen. I felt the presence of God. I felt goodness radiating from me. And I thought to my, I left, when I left, I left thinking about them. I got on the road. I'm on the highway. I'm still thinking about them. Today, I'm still thinking about them. They didn't say anything to me that I went, oh, wow, hallelujah, that's deep truth. Oh, amen. But there was something that radiated pure goodness. As I mentioned, we're in Laguna Beach. Laguna Beach has rich people, a lot of rich people. You know, you know, you don't know somebody's rich by what they say. Am I right? Right. I, I mean, I could tell you, uh, or somebody could come up and say, I'm a millionaire. And uh, you wouldn't know it by what they say. Because anybody could say that. I'm uh, worth $5 million, you know. You, yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> but you realize it by what you see. So if that man says, uh, I, I, I'm a millionaire, and he's got all the bling bling going, and he, he, he says, you want me to give you a ride home? And you say, sure, I'm on a bike. And he puts you in his Bentley. You're in the Bentley going, the dude's kind of rich, yeah. right? He's in a Bentley, he's, he's got the money for the Bentley, right? right. So, so, you know people are rich uh, by not what they say necessarily, but what you see. You see, God wants to show us goodness, not so much by what we say, uh, but what you see. So. When Jesus saw the crippled man, what was his response? To display God's goodness, right? And everybody saw it. 
God just healed the crippled man. Uh, when, when Jesus had the 5,000 people at his meeting, the 5,000 men, and they ran out of food, and he was told, these guys are hungry, what are you going to do? It's interesting to me that when Jesus saw the hunger, he didn't call a board meeting to address it. He didn't say, guys, let's have a board meeting. 5,000 people are hungry. What Should we do something about it or not do something about it? Should we send them away and take our chances, or should we look to do something to feed them? And if we're going to feed them, there's only a couple of fish and a couple of loaves. It's impossible. So how do we do this? Everybody get a little crumb? I, I don't know. Let's discuss it. Jesus has no discussion. When he sees the need, he says to the disciples, feed them. He responds immediately to the need with God's goodness. Feed them. No discussion. You see, that's how we're to be who have experienced God's goodness. People don't care that you go home and preach to them and tell them that they need to be in church or this or that. They don't care one bit. But when they see in you God's goodness to them, that's what speaks volumes. Right. Amen. So whenever, like Jesus, you're faced with a situation that you can put God's goodness on it, it behooves you to do so. Show a little blame. Show the goodness of God bling on them. Put his goodness on them. And they will see it. And it will touch them. And it will do something to them. I'm going to leave you with this. Jesus gave one of the most scary parables, in my opinion, out of everything he taught. This, this one to this day freaks me out. It really freaks me out. Jesus is explaining to a group of people the difference between sheep and goats. To which he says, the sheep will go to heaven and the goats will go to hell. But what he then begins to describe as the difference, listen carefully. He said there was a group of people, when he talked to them, he says, uh, let me tell you guys something. When I was hungry, you didn't feed me. When I was naked and needed clothes, you didn't clothe me. When I was in prison, you never visited me. He said, depart from me, you wicked me. You're wicked. Get out of here. Depart from me. Into everlasting damnation. To which they said, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you needing clothes? When did we see you, Jesus, in prison? Because if we'd known it was you, we'd have done something about it. This is what Jesus says to them. In that you have done it to the least, you've done it to me. The least. The least. You've done it to me. Then he turns to the other group of people, the sheep, and he says, when I was hungry, you fed me. Uh, when I needed clothes, you clothed me. And when I was in prison, you visited me. To which they said, uh, when did we see you, Jesus, hungry or needing clothes or in prison? And he said the same thing to them. When you did it to the least, you did it to me. What was the difference between the sheep and the goats? There is only one thing what they did and they didn't do. You, you got it? Uh -huh. yeah. What they did and they didn't do. So when you experience and you begin to taste God's goodness, and you begin to realize that God is really, really good, and you get the blinders lifted, it is now your job, like it was Jesus, to mirror God's goodness to other people. That's your job. Amen. That's your job. 
And he will bring people into your life that need a touch of his goodness. But he ain't going to touch them without touching them through you. You're the conduit. I'm the conduit. Amen. The girl at the grocery store in the checkout lane. I'm the conduit to show her God's goodness. In little ways, in big ways, in whatever. I'm that conduit. In every situation, God has been good to me. I'm going to reflect his goodness on that individual. I did a really stupid thing. I did want to go to a restaurant. I was at Ralph's. So I went and got salad. But I accident I didn't know that there was a salad thing. I put the salad in all the soup containers and I filled up a bunch of soup containers. And I went to the checkout and I said, I, I'm thinking something's wrong with this. How do you put all this salad? I've got all these containers. So I got to the checkout and I said, you know. I think I did something wrong. She looked at me like, you are the most stupid guy. You're a moron. And she said, yeah, you, you put your salad in soup containers. It, there's, a, there's a salad container there. And I'm like, there is? She said, yeah, if I charge you for all the soup containers, it's going to be a lot more than the salad container. So she said to the gal, the gal putting groceries, she said, go get this. She wanted to say this idiot, a salad container. Go get him a salad container, moron. So she said, I'm pushing your stuff aside. You wait over there so we don't hold up the line. So I stood over in the corner waiting, and the gal took like forever. So all these people are going by like, you're an idiot, you're an idiot, you're an idiot. That's all, you're, you're a real moron. I'm standing there going, yep, I know, I've heard it already by the lady at the register, I'm a moron. She finally came back with my salad thing, and she's looking at me like, I don't believe you did this. So they stopped the line, put all the salad in the thing, and buttoned it all up. And, uh, and I looked at her. Now, I could have reacted a number of ways, but God has been so good to me, I wanted to reflect his goodness to her. I didn't say, you know what, I'm a born-again Christian, you know, pastor up in Fairfield, and you need to get saved, honey. I said, I said, I said to her, I said, man, you know, thank you for taking care of me. I didn't know there was a salad thing. But I'm so grateful that you pointed that out and you helped me and saved me a few bucks. Thank you so much for doing that. I wish I could repay you. She looked at me like, I do not believe what you just said to me. Are you kidding me? She got a taste of God's goodness. Now, whether she knows I'm a Christian or not, I'm probably not. But she got a taste of God's goodness nonetheless. That's your job. That's my job. That's right. My job is to get it and reflect it to other people. Show other people. You know that person in your life you just can't stand? Ooh. They may be in your life so God can use you to reflect goodness. Because you know why? They know you can't stand them. And they know how hard it's going to be for you to give them goodness. And when you do, they're knowing how much you don't like them. When you do give them goodness, they'll know there's a God. Including me, that's why they're in your life for no other reason than you to reflect.